Thank you for listening or watching our podcast. Baptism is a sign of the covenant and not our faith. We do not see baptism having its origins in the New Testament, but originating in the Old Testament. If this is true, then why does the New Testament so clearly seem to teach that one first professes their faith and then they are baptized? Where do we see baptism as a sign of the covenant rather than a sign of our faith? Where do we see that baptism is a picture of the gospel that shows us a warning and assurance of the Lord's blessing and his covenantal promises? If you are curious about these questions, please stay tuned and listen to our sermon on baptism. When we look at 1 Corinthians 7, we might wonder what this passage has to do with baptism. As this is a passage that seems to be dealing with a whole other situation as to how do the Corinthian church or how do members of the Corinthian church in particular interact with one another if one's married um, and is converted and your spouse is not converted? How, how do they live uh, within the confines and context of that marriage? In fact, if we look at 1 Corinthians 7 verse 14, uh, where Paul exhorts the church or the non-Christian and a Christian to stay married as long as they're uh, willing to do so in the context of this, it would seem that the more immorality that we would engage in, the more we would sanctify immorality or sin, right? Somebody might try to make that case if you look at 1 Corinthians 7. However, that's not the case when you look at 1 Corinthians 5 and 6 because clearly Paul contradicts any such thinking, especially Romans 6, where we're reminded not to live in sin as new creatures in Christ. So what is the significance of this identity of being in covenant with God? Why, why do we seek our children and, and place a sign upon them that they are in covenant with God? And, and what is this text fundamentally telling us? I mean, is a baptism the thing that's making them clean or is there something else going on? Well, as we look at this, we'll see first, what is the clean and unclean that Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14? Secondly, what, what is the issue that Paul's really dealing with in this church? And third, what does this really mean for baptism? How does this imply uh, baptism when, when the text never really explicitly mentions baptism at all? And so let's begin with what is the clean and unclean. Notice what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14. He says, otherwise your children would be unclean. And we might think, well, does that mean they just need a bath? Is that what Paul's saying, that we need to practice better hygiene? I mean, obviously that's uh, something that's appreciated by all when we come together, but I don't think that's the intention of the text. The intention of the text is something else that, that's going on here in terms of clean and unclean, especially when you look at this in light of 1 Corinthians 6. So we have this issue of how this culture is functioning and how this culture is engaging in sin. We have 1 Corinthians 6 uh, where you have this, this warning of uh, men going into the uh, temple uh, prostitutes or what they'd say priestesses. And Paul's saying this is immoral, this is not appropriate, this is something contrary to the Christian life. Uh, this is not clean, this is not wholesome, this is not worship, it is not appropriate. And so the, the Apostle Paul, in terms of this clean or unclean, it's not about the intimacy within marriage between a man and a woman uh, who are joined together in the bond of marriage. That's, that's not the issue, he's not afraid of intimacy or anything that's going on in terms of the marriage covenant. He's talking about another context in 1 Corinthians 6 that's clearly unclean. And that's engaging in a culture of immorality and going into the pagan temples and calling this worship when clearly it's not worship at all. It's just blatant uh, sexual immorality that's going on. The Apostle Paul also warns in 1 Corinthians 5, which is sort of an interesting contrast, when you look at 1 Corinthians 5 and 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14. Because you have the one believing spouse who makes a whole house 
holy. But when you look at 1 Corinthians 5, there's a warning in terms of the church of the immoral individual who needs to be put out, who's living in immorality, and everybody knows uh, this individual is living in immorality. And he uses the language of the little leaven, leavening the whole lump, going through the whole church. So it seems the one can compromise the whole, right? And so when you look at 1 Corinthians 5, you look at 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14, it almost seems that there's a contradiction. You have the one who makes the whole body unclean, and then you have 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14, the situation there where the one believing spouse makes the whole household clean or set apart unto the Lord. So what's going on here? Well, I'd argue that in order for us to understand Paul's argument as he's building on the Old Testament, we need to understand the Old Testament statements that are going on here and the assumptions that Paul has. So a distinction in the Old Testament you find is clean, unclean throughout Leviticus. I don't think we need to go through every reference. If you're curious, you're free to read Leviticus. It's all laid out there in terms of the Levitical law for the people of God. Basically, the clean things are the things that are wholesome unto God. The things that uh, sanctify, set apart a community. The things that are unclean, as we see uh, the, the models there going on, uh, of people who have all sorts of potential blemishes or things going on, where they're outside of the community. They're unclean. They're not to be part of God's people. And so this distinction of clean and unclean, when we understand it from the Old Testament, is an understanding of a classification or, or a group of things that are set apart that would make the community wholesome, whole, put together, appropriate before the Lord, honoring God. Things that are unclean are presented as things that are dishonoring to God, inappropriate, not things that God has ordained contrary to his will. So when you look at this then in terms of what I've set out, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 6, it's not really a contradiction at all. Because Paul is saying 1 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 6, what's going on in the Corinthian church is unwholesome. Now what's going on is they're claiming I love God, but at the same time saying I want to go to the pagan temples, I want to worship like a pagan, engage in immorality, and say that this is actually worship and wholesome unto the Lord. And Paul basically acting like Hosea is saying no. Uh, you're trying to baptize something that's not intended to be baptized or made holy or wholesome unto God. This is immorality. And that's all it is, period, no matter what they want to say. So when we look at this clean and unclean in 1 Corinthians 7, Paul's talking about a whole different scenario in, in terms of, of intimacy within a marriage, isn't he? He's saying actually what's going on is you're within the boundaries and confines of marriage. God has ordained marriage. When God created Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, the two became one flesh, and this was ordained and blessed by God. God did not say this was immoral. God did not say this is sinful. It's a pre-fall phenomenon. It's something that God intended for humanity. And so that's what the Apostle Paul is laying out to the church, that, that you can't just say that any sexual intimacy is just wrong and, 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 and immoral and shouldn't be participated in. He's saying there's a particular context in which this is good. This is wholesome. This is blessed by God within the confines of marriage. So the clean and the unclean distinction of what Paul is introducing here is he wants the community to understand that marriage uh, in, in this particular scenario is not necessarily a bad thing. He's saying this is good. And so when he's speaking of this clean and unclean and this coming together and this consecration, obviously this is debated. How, how do we say that this is consecrated? Does it mean that uh, the believing spouse is the one that saves a whole family. Is that what Paul's arguing? That because of, of the one faith, the whole family is saved unto God. Well, some people may try to argue that. 
Uh, but the reality is when we look at this nature of uh, making holy or setting something apart or sanctifying something, all this is saying is that it's setting something apart unto the Lord. So we have the Lord entering his Sabbath rest, pronouncing a benediction, a blessing on creation, setting it apart, blessing it, saying it is holy, it is good. We have Moses consecrating the people, Exodus 19.14. He's setting them apart unto the Lord. And we can see this throughout Scripture, that it's a people, a community set apart, consecrated unto God, not really saying whether they are in or out in terms of having regeneration. It's just saying that they're set apart unto the Lord as a community. Uh, Paul does use this language in other places. So some people will look at this and they'll look at, say, 1 Corinthians 1 verse 30, where there is a sense where Paul uses this in redeeming something. So it's actually in the interaction of something that's unclean. You make it redeemed or holy. 6 verse 11 speaks of the actual sanctification. But when we look at this and we say, well, then it must mean that the one believing spouse sanctifies or saves the family. Well, if we go on in the context, we see that would be a contradiction. Because verse 16, he speaks of a future reality. And he says, for how do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? In other words, the Apostle Paul is saying by the authority of Christ... How, how do you know? So uh, maybe in living out your marital duties and identity before the Lord, if you're not called to singleness, but you're called to marriage, you're in a scenario where you have an unbelieving spouse, how do you know that your life isn't going to lead to the Lord using it to save the, the unbelieving spouse? So Paul is saying, let's, let's understand the Lord works in a variety of means. We don't always understand his providence and the timing of his providence, but God in his providence has a plan. And so Paul is saying, be content to operate and function in the timing of God by the providence of God, trusting that the Lord will do what he desires to do. Now, not only does the context tell us that it's not the one believing spouse that saves a whole family, but Paul uses this language also in Romans 11, Verse 16, where he speaks of the first fruit sacrifice, where the first fruits consecrate the whole of the sacrifice uh, dealing with Israel and the church. And so again, it's not that the one saves the other, but it's consecrating uh, the reality uh, of what is being offered unto God. And so I think we understand the notion of clean and unclean. So if your children are viewed as unclean, they would be like the fruit of the land in Leviticus 19, verse uh, 23, where it's considered uncircumcised, unholy. And so Paul is saying, we, we don't want to say your children are unclean. We, we don't want to say that, that your children have no relationship to God and, and you don't raise them in the Lord. We, we should see them as clean. So we kind of have an overview of what's going on. So what's the specific scenario that Paul's writing about in uh, 1 Corinthians 7. Because notice, he says, now concerning the matters about which you wrote. So 1 Corinthians 7 is where Paul is making a transition from chapter 5, chapter 6, addressing other issues going on in the church, to now chapter 7. And the scenario is a rather tough scenario, isn't it, in terms of uh, the New Testament church. Because when you think of Israel, they, they were told specifically not to be unequally yoked. So Israel understood, you know, if you're in a situation where you marry an unbeliever or a foreigner, you've heard the Lord warn you. There's consequences for that. And, and so the community can say, listen, you, you knew there were consequences. Uh, the Lord warned you. He told you through Moses, told you through Abraham. Don't do that. And so the, the community within Israel would know better. But when we come to the church, we have pagans where the gospel goes forth and one pagan might all of a sudden be converted and say, you know, this Christian thing seems to make sense to me. But the spouse may say, no, this, 
crucified deliverer on a cross who dies from capital punishment. That's absurd. I'm not going to believe that insanity. That's crazy. Why would you believe that? Well, the believing spouse is converted, believes it, is convicted of it. And so the scenario is, what do we do? If it's immoral to go to the temple and to engage in immorality on that level, how do we function in marriage? If I'm not to go with a temple priestess, to put it politely, I guess as the Corinthians would baptize it, but Paul says what's really going on there, how do I view my spouse if my spouse is an unbeliever? Is it like the pagan temple? Or, or am I to truly live out every obligation of marriage and to truly engage in intimacy as God has ordained? Can I do this in a clean conscience? So you can understand the scenario. Do I stay married, live as a roommate? We live in separate rooms and we just stay in the same house. Uh, do, do we really live out the marriage as we're intended to live out the marriage? Do we divorce? Do we just go our separate ways? What, what's, what's the ethical obligation here? And the Apostle Paul is saying, listen, God works out his redemption in the context of a fallen world. And God understands that there's those that can be converted, and, and they're converted after they've been married, and they have a spouse that's not believing. And as they have the spouse that's not believing, Paul's saying, listen, live together, practice this marriage as you're called to practice this marriage, right? So verse 3, verse 5, the Apostle Paul says, engage in the marital intimacy as you're called to engage in this intimacy. That's what you're called to do. Don't send one another away. Continue to live as a married couple because this is in the context of marriage. You're not doing anything sinful. So right there, there's an appeasement, right? The unbelieving spouse is making the concession. I think what you believe is crazy, but if you want to go to that synagogue, that church, that gathering together uh, as a church was being formed, or go to that house church, whatever you're doing, go. Do it. I won't stand in the way. I, I just think you're crazy. But yet, you're still willing to live at peace and live together. Paul's saying in that scenario, great. Now, the other scenario is if the spouse says, you're not going to do this, this is immoral. If you continue to do this, I'm going to divorce you. Paul's saying, well, then you let your spouse go their separate way. But you're not the one who's trying to make this happen. And again, Paul's saying, ideally, this is not what we want to happen. But he's saying, the reality is, it might be a scenario. So he's saying to the church, be gracious to this scenario as well. But don't try to sabotage the marriage out of some self-righteous act or some other Christian claim. And so that's basically the summation of what Paul's doing here. And now when, when Paul, sometimes this gets controversial for people when people say, the Lord says not I, or I say not the Lord. People say, well, <clears throat> is the Apostle Paul contradicting Christ on purpose or is Christ contradicting Paul and then what kind of apostle do we have here where this apostle doesn't speak the words of Christ and Christ is not speaking the words of the apostle that's not the intention what Paul's saying here is he's saying this is a unique scenario when Christ walked the face of the earth Christ didn't address this issue why because primarily he was ministering to the Jewish nation and Samaritans and occasionally Gentiles. And we do see Gentile interactions. But it's not that we have this mass conversion. It seems even with the Gentiles he interacts with, they're those who are uh, members of the Jewish synagogue and at least familiar with some messianic theology. Right? So it's, it's not a married couple who are pagans and get converted, and then the Lord deals with these individuals who are outside of the kingdom. That's not the case at all. So when Paul says, I'm dealing with this, he's saying, this is a unique scenario. I grant that. Well, what do you do with a non-Christian Christian interaction in relationship here? And so when, when Paul mentions this, he wants them to understand there's a bigger issue, right, when we talk about the, the main issue. Not only how do I view my spouse, how do I function in the context of marriage with an unbeliever, and yes, you, the Lord may use this in his providence to save the unbelieving spouse, that's the ultimate ideal, but the other pressing issue is, 
how do I raise my children? If my spouse is an unbeliever who follows, you know, these other deities and these variety of gods, and I'm a Christian and I believe there's one God and I believe in Christ, do I view my child and my children as those who are outside of the promises of God, or do I view them as inside the promises of God? And that's why Paul, in 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14, says this wonderful thing. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. So Paul wants to drive home the reality that based upon the faith of one parent, how does that parent raise up the child? Well, the parent raises up the child in the promises of God. And the parent treats that child as that child is in covenant with God. It's not to say the child's regenerate or unregenerate. We, we don't know that. And ultimately, only God knows who's regenerate and unregenerate. But the reality is a parent views the child as a child is in covenant with God, set apart unto the Lord, and communicates and raises a child in those promises. So the issue then is, how do I function in the context of marriage with an unbeliever when I've been converted and my spouse is not, con <clears throat> not converted? The Apostle Paul is saying, live within the context of the marriage. Be married. Be a married couple. Enjoy the marriage. See it as a blessing from God. And then you say, well, how do I view my children? He's saying, well, you view your children as set apart unto the Lord. So obviously this brings us to our last point. What does this mean for baptism? And the fundamental issue in terms of the baptism debate, and unfortunately it isn't always framed this way, but it really should be framed this way, it's a debate as to whether or not baptism is a sign of regeneration, which would be my faith, or is baptism a sign of the covenant? You see, if it's a sign of regeneration or my faith primarily, I mean, certainly there's symbolism going on there of new birth in terms of the covenantal promises of God. I don't deny that symbolism. But it's not primarily a sign of regeneration. If it's a sign of regeneration, it would mean that only those who receive this sign are those who can truly articulate their faith. That would mean that it's absolutely immoral if that's true, it would be immoral to baptize infants. Now, I baptize an infant. I don't want to consider myself someone who's immoral or sinful in terms of consciously living in sin, not fighting the good fight, you know, striving to, to conform to Christ. I mean, I, I want to do what's honorable to him. So I wouldn't want to just administer a sign and be immoral and lead the church in immorality. And so I see this sign as a sign of the covenant. And when we look at 1 Corinthians 7, verse 14, that's how I see the Apostle Paul reading the sign. And when we think about what has been revealed in terms of Paul's writings, right? We read from Colossians 3. I want to read from that because not only does it lay out how we live our lives before the world as Christians, and not only exhorting us in that, but it also calls our, our families to see how we function in the context of Christ. And so think about that. Fathers are exhorted not to be harsh with their children, right? You know, as a, there's a reminder there, it's not to say that women have a free pass there. But Paul's sort of playing as of where were the fathers, especially in that culture where fathers had a lot of uh, latitude in terms of what they could do to their sons if their sons uh, truly showed that they weren't worthy of the family name, if you will. You could uh, kick them out of the house. You could even have them executed in some cases. Uh, so you can understand where Paul's saying, fathers, uh, understand your call in, in terms of raising up the, this family. Don't be overly harsh. Don't, don't give in to that. But there's also the call for children to obey their parents. So we can understand fathers having this call in terms of the covenant, mothers having this call in terms of this covenant, that they're adults, but it's also the children are exhorted in terms of the covenantal promises of God to live out this obligation. 
they are called to please their God. It's not to say parents are always right. I'm sure kids in this congregation would say that their parents have always done a bang-up job and the parents have never messed up. But for other people that might think maybe their parents make some mistakes once in a while, the reality is the Apostle Paul is not dismissing that. He's just saying, understand that your fundamental call is to honor your God, right? Honor the Lord. As children, members of the covenant, honor the Lord. But Paul also says this in Ephesians 6, 1. And the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 6 cites Exodus 20, verse 12, saying that this is the first commandment with a promise when he gives this to children. In other words, he's grounding this in the Old Testament. As children of the old covenant were to obey their parents by the command of God, so children of the new covenant are to obey their parents by the command of God. Sign of circumcision, what happens there? Goes to the household. Abraham, in his lack of faith, evidence in Genesis 16, receives a sign where the Lord's making it explicit to him. I am going to raise up the covenantal heir through you. The sign will be administered to the organ of generation, pointing to the reality that the seed of, of the woman will arise in history and be triumphant. This is why Paul logically ties circumcision and baptism together in Colossians 2, 11 and 12. That as circumcision is a sign of being cut off, if one wants no part of this community... It's also a sign of being cut off in a representative. The seed of the woman will be the triumphant one in their place. It's a twofold warning. Baptism has the same sign, doesn't it? We think of that with Noah and his ark. We think of that with Moses and Israel passing through the Red Sea. That sign of the covenant being ministered there with a reminder of a community being designated unto God and those outside the community separated from that community designated unto God. We don't find absolute perfection either, do we? Because we find after the Red Sea crossing, Israel grumbling in the wilderness, some dying. People walk off the ark, we have Ham who turns away from the Lord. So I think we, we've made the point, and we can look in the Acts and see the household formulas where one believes and then the whole household is baptized, etc., but getting back to 1 Corinthians 7 with all this information, when the Apostle Paul turns to the unbelieving spouse or to the believing spouse that lives in this marriage, then he's not saying it's necessarily easy. He's not saying it's necessarily joyful. But he gives a wonderful hope, doesn't he? Because one might wonder, well, then how do I really view my children? Because that's really the pressing issue. I know all that data from Abraham. I know all that data from Moses. But, but what does it really mean in a marriage where I've been converted after my marriage and, and here I am in this marriage and my spouse doesn't believe or, or whatever scenario has gone on? And the Apostle Paul is saying, listen, basically don't overthink this. The Lord is aware that his redemptive purpose is being worked out in an imperfect world. And as it's worked out in an imperfect world, view your family as set apart unto the Lord. Even though it may not be ideal, view it as set apart unto the Lord. As you raise up your kids, raise them up in the Lord. This is why we baptize our infants, that they bear the sign of the covenant. And it's a wonderful thing when we think of the ideal situation of both parents believing and both parents being on the same page of wanting to raise their children in the Lord. And it's a wonderful thing to see the Lord's covenantal promise worked out. And so in terms of this, when we say, how is this really a call for baptism? Is it the baptism that makes the children unclean? What does that mean? Ultimately, it's not the baptism that's making the fundamental difference. Now, I, I don't want to deprecate the sacramental sign either. Obviously, <clears throat> baptism is that public sign designating a child as being in covenant with God. It's a beautiful picture. It's that reminder of moving from death to life in Christ Jesus, swallowed by the sea, the place of death, and emerging triumphant in Christ Jesus. Wonderful promises of the gospel. <clears throat> 
of knowing that our lives are secured in Christ when we take hold of him by faith. That's what it's picturing for all of us. And as we raise up our children, remind them of that baptismal promise, that baptismal sign. We remind them, you are set apart unto the Lord. When we discipline our children, hopefully in our best moments, we're reminding them, well, even in our worst moments, we're reminding them that they're set apart unto the Lord as his redeemed. And as a parent, we want them to truly understand the promises of God, the consequences for sin, the, the beauty of living a life before the Lord and the promises of the gospel, and exhorting our children to consciously embrace this. And 1 Corinthians 7 verse 14 is giving that wonderful promise where whatever circumstance someone may find themselves in, whatever's happened in their history, whatever has transpired, that if they are married to an unbelieving spouse, there is a promise that the covenantal promises of God are so rich, so sure, so wonderful, that that household is still set apart unto the Lord. May the Lord then grant us the wisdom to seek his humility or to humble ourselves before him, to submit to the yoke of Christ, desiring to raise our children in the ways of the Lord. May our children truly embrace the promises of the gospel, that they don't just believe it because they want to please mom and dad, but they believe it because it's the substance of their conviction. May the Lord continue to work in the midst of us, and may we desire to live out the gospel for his honor and glory. Amen. Thank you for watching or listening to our podcast. Belgrade URC is a Bible-believing, Reformed, confessional church that seeks to cultivate community around our Savior. If you desire to learn more about Christianity, please join us for worship each Sunday at 10 a.m., and 6 p.m. If you're not able to attend church, you can tune in to our Sunday live stream through our YouTube channel. Please subscribe to our current sermon series and weekly meditation through iTunes or your favorite podcast catcher. If we are not listed on your favorite podcasting host, please let us know through our webpage, urcbelgrade.com. You can also utilize our archive sermon series on our website, urcbelgrade.com. Most of all, we hope to see you sojourning and fellowshipping with us each Sunday. Until we meet again, may the Lord's blessing and peace be upon you.